so it's a great pleasure today to welcome uh, Dwight Barclay from Warwick. Uh, Dwight obtained his PhD in physics from the University of Texas at Austin. He worked for one year in Caltech with uh, Philip Safman, and then he spent three years uh, in Princeton working with Yanis Kevrakidis and Steve Orzag. And in 1994, he joined the faculty at Warwick. Dwight, I'm sure he's known to many of you. He's the recipient of many prizes and awards and has done much seminal work. His early work was into uh, waves and excitable media. He's done a lot on nonlinear dynamics. He's also known, according to Wikipedia, for deriving an equation to estimate how long it will be until a child in the car asks the question, are we there yet? Sounds like good research. He now works on transition into turbulence. He's the author of the first JFM perspective in fluid mechanics on this topic. And he's also part of an international team recently funded by the Simons Foundation to revisit the turbulence problem using statistical mechanics. So uh, welcome Dwight and uh, we look forward to your talk. So uh, thank you uh, and I want to thank uh, the organizers not only for the uh, kind invitation but for organizing this series. Uh, we've come to really look forward to these seminars on Friday afternoons. Uh, and I want to thank Steve personally for his um, patience and help in uh, uh, getting set up for this talk. So notwithstanding the, the title that I gave, uh, what I'm going to discuss today is the route to turbulence in wall-bounded shear flows. And over the past approximately 20 years, but particularly in the past 10 years, there's been a, um, a fundamental uh, paradigm shift in our understanding of how these flows become turbulent as you increase Reynolds number. And we now know that what's important is it's a complicated spatial temporal process with deep connections to uh, 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 critical transitions in uh, statistical physics. And that's what I want to tell you about. So let me start with something simple. This is a um, subcritical transition, also known as a harder first order transition. What you see here is a tape measure with a magnetic ball stuck on the end of it to add a little bit of weight. And right now it's currently in a mechanical equilibrium. There's a control parameter for the system, which is the length of the tape. And I'm going to increase that control parameter. And I maintain a continuous a variation of that first equilibrium. However, there's now a second equilibrium uh, is available to the system. There's a threshold between the two. It's reversible. You can go back and forth. I decrease the control parameter a little bit. That second equilibrium still exists. I can transition between the two back and forth, perfectly reversible. As I continue to decrease that control parameter, the length of the tape, eventually I get to a point where I lose that second equilibrium. Here, I'll show you that here. Okay, so I only have the one equilibrium, the, what I'll refer to as the simple, simple equilibrium. So we're all familiar with this, and we would typically plot, plot a bifurcation diagram as shown here. We'd plot the control parameter as a function of some amplitude, think it as, of it as a deviation from the simple state. So we have one equilibrium, which is the unbent tape measure. Uh, it exists and is stable for a large range of uh, control parameters. But at some finite value of the control parameter, a second equilibrium is born through a saddle node bifurcation, and then we have two equilibria and a threshold uh, separating the two. So this idea is, I think, very familiar to everybody here. Now, subcritical shear flows have basically the same characteristic. We have laminar state, uh, which is a mechanical equilibrium of the flow, and it exists for all Reynolds numbers or all Reynolds numbers of concern, and is linearly stable for all Reynolds numbers of interest in this talk. And then, but at some, some finite Reynolds number, typically on the order of a thousand, it varies with the precise definition and the precise flow, but anyway, between a few hundred and a few thousand, turbulence um, exists as a coexisting mechanical equilibrium of the system. So we and it appears at finite amplitude. And it's separated from the laminar branch by some threshold, which is not as simple as shown here, but nevertheless, it, uh, it exists. Okay, and so this has led to the view, historically, that as one increases Reynolds number in these flows, the reach to turbulence is discontinuous. And one of the things that we've learned now, and we understand quite well, is that this is just an incorrect statement. When viewed in the way that you would, so let's say, properly or naturally view the system, the route of turbulence is in fact continuous, at least in many cases. It follows a very specific statistical phase transition with well-defined critical points and universal scaling. So that's what I want to tell you about. Now, 
in the way of a little bit more background, let me turn to some observations by Reynolds from 1883. These are some sketches modeled after his uh, paper. So here we have um, pipe flow. This is the entrance to the pipe and dye is injected upstream. At low values of the flow rate, or what we now call Reynolds number, the flow is laminar and you get a straight uh, streak line. Uh, at high values of the Reynolds number, the flow becomes turbulent within a short distance uh, of the entrance to the pipe. And so these are our two mechanical equilibria. Now, as was well understood by Reynolds, in fact, and what is not shown here is that at this higher Reynolds number, the one shown here, if you very do this very experiment very, very carefully, in fact, the laminar branch still exists. It's still linearly stable. It's still accessible. It's just, it's here, it's masked by perturbations and noise. Now, <clears throat> what Reynolds also noted was that um, there's a regime in which the flow is intermittent or transitional, I use the modern words, in which turbulence is intermixed within laminar flow, right? And this is going to be our interest. And I put this on here just to remind me because I'll do it without noticing. These, today we call these patches of turbulence within the laminar background, we call these puffs, and I will just, I will tend to use that word. So what we want to understand are two things in this talk. We want to understand how it is that turbulent flow becomes intermittent and transitional. And then we want to understand by what scenario this, uh, this transitional flow re re reverts to laminar flow. That's what it is I want to discuss. Okay, so let me show you some uh, intermittent flows in a variety of cases. I'm not going to discuss these in detail, um, just with one exception, with this plain coet uh, experiment here from pre jean et al. from 2002. And I'm showing this for a couple reasons. The first of which is, is this is how I became interested in the problem. What you're seeing here is plain coet flow. Now, unfortunately, I cannot see my, um, my stuff, so I have to um, show it to you here. This is a model of the, the, the experiment by pre jean et al. So there's a plate moving in one direction on one side and a plate moving the other direction on the other side. That's plain coet flow. And there's a fluid in between. And this is approximately, hopefully you can see that, this is approximately the correct aspect ratio of this experiment. Uh, and let me just say one more thing now while I'm thinking of it because I might forget later. I'm going to refer to this as a planar situation, but you should recall that it really is three-dimensional. There's a fluid in there. Um, it's just that it's a very large aspect ratio in two dimensions, okay? So um, what, what they observed was that, uh, is what you see here, this, these, these lighter regions are turbulent flow and the darker regions are laminar flow, turbulent laminar, and it organizes into this periodic banded structure tilted obliquely to the streamwise direction. So this is a nice problem in pattern formation and I got interested in this and did some work on it, but I'm not going to describe that here. But I just wanted to say how I got involved in these problems in the first place. And let me just show you a movie by Duguay, Schlatter, and Henningsen of roughly the same uh, circumstance and you can see the formation of these bands. In this case, you're seeing both orientations, oblique this way and oblique that way. But again, to emphasize that this really is turbulence in there intermixed with laminar flow. Right? And I think that's all I really want to say about this slide. So here's what we have. We have laminar flow, we have fully developed turbulent flow, and in between is this interesting, complicated spatial temporal complexity flow. And uh, to organize things, I want to plot as a function of turbulent fraction. So that's the fraction of the flow that's turbulent. So in the laminar state, there's no turbulence, it's zero. In the fully turbulent state, it's one by definition, so it's one. And then in the, this intermittent regime, it's going to be some place between zero and one, depending on precisely how you define it. So that's, this is the, scenario that I'm going to be dealing with. I'm going to describe two things as I've already alluded to. I want to describe, tell you why it is that fully developed turbulence would become intermittent in the first place. And this is going to be the organizing center for transition, I would say. That's what I'm going to argue. I'm going to focus on what happens in this intermittent regime, but I just want to say here now that in fact, what I'm going to describe in terms of this process, this organizing center, also describes what you see at higher Reynolds number for several thousand in Reynolds number, depending on the flow, okay? So that's thing one. The other thing I want to discuss is what has attracted a great deal of attention in, in recent years, which is the critical point for the onset of turbulence and the universality associated with that. So that's the second thing I'll discuss. Okay, before beginning, let me just say that this is a rich field. Of, there's a lot of work uh, on this problem and uh, related problems, and I won't be able to discuss all that understandably. I do just want to acknowledge colleagues and collaborators, and I list many people here from whom I've learned a lot about this problem, and I'm sorry I can't cite all of your work. 
Okay, so let me, the, the, the first thing I, then I want to discuss is the mechanism underlying intermittency. Um, here's a list of references. You can find this in my JFM perspective, and these are, I think, are the good references which give you the basic mechanics and mechanisms involved here. And then I also want to uh, acknowledge particularly discussions with Baofeng Song, Mark Avila, and Bjorn Hopp, from whom I've learned a, a great deal about this. All right, so here's intermittency. I'm going to show you in pipe flow. I'm going to mostly focus on pipe flow, at least for this first half of the talk. Um, what you're seeing, just take it to be uh, turbulent kinetic energy in the co-moving reference frame. And this is a nice movie by Bofang Song. What you're seeing here is initially the flow in the turbulent state, just a little bit above where there's intermittency. And what Bofang is going to do is he's going to drop the, the Reynolds number instantaneously to a number, probably Reynolds number 2000. That would be the normal choice that one would make. It's very much in the intermittent regime. It's a nice round number. And you see the formation of these puffs as I've already described. And what I want to explain is why does this happen? Right? That's my goal. And to do that, the, what I found is the fastest, clearest way to explain this is to understand what happens to the flow following localized perturbation in the pipe. So I'm imagining I have laminar flow and I'm going to inject a perturbation. This is what experimentalists do all the time. And I'm going to ask what happens. Well, what happens depends on Reynolds number. At transitional Reynolds numbers, at these intermittent Reynolds numbers, again, typically 2000, if you look in a space-time diagram, you see one of these localized puffs. It travels down the pipe, maintains localized structure, as I've discussed. If you go up to higher Reynolds number, 5000, the turbulence expands. Um, and it, the, the word it's used is slug, and I will uh, use that word. So you have a, a downstream and an upstream front, and between those, the turbulence is expanding. Um, a lot of the focus here is going to be on what happens at this upstream front. I'll just uh, alert you to that in advance. Okay. Just to show some experimental work, those, those were just uh, my little sketches. Here's some actual experimental measurements um, from the paper by Nishi et al. and JFM. I invite you to go look at that. Um, again, the puff and slug, these are actually time-space diagrams, but they convey the same information. I, will, uh, I think it's pretty clear that you see the localized puff and the expanding slug. I do want to emphasize that what you're seeing here is, a, uh, is measurements of center line velocity. That's quite an important quantity. Um, it's going to come up later, so I'll just alert you to that now. In particular, I want you to notice with this puff, when you measure the center line velocity, it is asymmetric about the front and back. Right? So anyway, we have puffs and we have slugs depending on the Reynolds. One final thing I wanted to show you is I want to show you puffs in experiment and simulation, and this gives me the opportunity to highlight a work that comes out of Tom Mullen's lab. So what you're going to see here at the top is a movie by uh, George Pexino and Tom Mullen. And it's a, 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 what I just described. It's laminar flow in a pipe at Reynolds number 1900. And what they're going to do is they're going to give it a kick. It's going to form a puff. And then I'm going to start this movie down below by Mark Avila, which is showing streamwise vorticity in the pipe. Uh, in the pipe. It's also a puff. And this is moving downstream. You can see the camera's moving with the puff. It's moving at roughly constant speed, has constant intensity, constant streamwise length. It's pretty much a solitary structure as it moves down the pipe. Okay. So this is the key. So if you stop paying attention momentarily, this is the time to pay attention. I'm now going to explain in this one slide why intermittency forms. At least that's my intention. So I want to focus first on the slug. So what I show here is the slug, again, from Baofeng Song. It's, I want to imagine we're looking at it in the co-moving of frame in which this, this front, this upstream front is stationary. And what we have here is upstream, we have this laminar, uh, fully developed laminar flow. And I want you to think of that as fuel. There's a lot of kinetic energy in this laminar flow. Remember, kinetic energy goes to the square of the velocity. The centerline velocity is very large. There's a lot of kinetic energy there. It flows into this uh, front. And production, turbulent production exceeds dissipation. There's a lot of burn there. You should think of it as burning that laminar kinetic energy and turning it into turbulent kinetic energy. When you do that, necessarily you blunt the shear profile. I hope this shows up on, uh, over the internet. Uh, anyway, you'll see more of this in just a second. You blunt, you've taken energy out of the, 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 the mean shear, so you've blunted it, and uh, that's what it is. All right. And then you go into this equilibrium where production is equal to dissipation, and then you just remain in that state for arbitrarily, as long as your pipe is, you will just remain in that state, right? So um, let me just say one way I think it's very, I think it's very clear way to think about this. 
Um, if I look at an upstream cross section, there is no kinetic, turbulent kinetic energy crossing that upstream uh, section. If I look at a downstream section, there's definitely turbulent kinetic energy passing out of that downstream section. Everywhere in this flow, there, there's a balance between, produc between production and dissipation everywhere except here. This is the source of the kinetic energy leaving the pipe. All right, there has to be a source somewhere, that's it. Then the other thing I want you to, again, pay attention to is that we have these two equilibria that I've stressed and I'm going to continue to stress throughout this talk. We have the laminar state and we have the, and we have the turbulent state, the other a mechanical equilibrium of the system. Okay. Now what I want you to think about is what happens when I decrease the Reynolds number. When I decrease the Reynolds number, I change my control parameter. I already told you what happened in slide two. What I'm going to do is I'm going to lose this secondary state through some sort of bifurcation. Okay. So I'm going to do that and that state is gone. However, here at this front, production uh, uh, exceeded dissipation and that is going to survive that collapse of this downstream state. Okay. And that is what a puff is. Right. So we look at it. Here's incoming fuel. It gets burnt. You convert laminar kinetic energy to turbulent kinetic energy. You blunt the shear profile. Once you've blunted that shear profile, you can no longer, in the presence of this uh, deformed shear profile, you can no longer extract enough kinetic energy from the shear profile and the turbulence decays. Once that turbulence decays, the, the laminar profile is free to re, uh, to re accelerate and re energize. That, in a nutshell, is the process. So a, a, what a puff is, it's, a, it's just a front. It's the upstream front of a slug. It's just continually burning lam laminar uh, flow, but leaving behind no downstream loop. And I want to say that a puff necessarily includes this refractory region um, in which the flow reaccelerates. And this is an observation first made by Hoff et al. Science uh, 2010. It's really quite crucial to the full story here. And one final thing I invite you to think about this way. This is a Bunsen burner. I think you realize that. The air fuel mixture is moving upwards. The flame front is moving downwards. And that's your equilibrium. And it will really, really help you to think about puffs if you view them this way. And with that in mind, let's go back to Bolfang's simulation. And I'll just show it to you again. And now maybe you can see that what this is, is this is, a, this is like a, a flame front. So there's incoming laminar flow of fuel. It gets burnt. The, the, uh, the profile gets modified, the turbulence is no longer sustained, you burn the fuel. However, unlike a Bunsen burner, you can re-accelerate and you can uh, have plenty of fuel left for the next puff, et cetera, et cetera. And while I'm thinking of it, because I didn't say this before, these look relatively periodic. They are not in general periodic. They could be spaced more or less arbitrarily, except for the fact that there's a minimum distance based on this recovery period. Okay. So the turbulence can be stained in this intermittent state precisely because it's intermittent, precisely because you can pick up kinetic energy in these laminar gaps. There is no equilibrium. You've lost the, the, the uniform equilibrium. It's gone to the system. It, it doesn't exist anymore. But this spatially intermittent e equilibrium does. OK, hopefully that's clear. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, just to say that uh, this is from the paper Song et al. 2017 in which this is Wolfgang's uh, thesis work in which he analyzed these things very carefully. I'll just go very quickly. This is a puff, and these are two different kinds of slugs uh, in space-time visualizations. And I think you can see that this upstream front of the slug continuously deforms and becomes the puff. Likewise, in terms of these uh, turbulent kinetic energy budgets, you can see this is the kinetic energy budget of the upstream front, the production and dissipation. This is the core of the slug. And you can see that once you lose that, um, that equilibrium uh, of the core of the slug, you remain with this uh, upstream front, which is the puff. Okay, just saying the same thing over and over again. So let me come back to this. So we have these two equilibria, this one and this one. Uh, again, the two, the two states of the tape measure. And what we're interested now in is, is fronts between these two uh, equilibria. And what, what I would like to present is um, a spatial temporal theory for transition based on these ideas, these ingredients. Um, now, this idea, these ideas go back uh, a long ways, probably even further back than what I'm showing here, but I want to mention three things in particular. Don Coles, who in this uh, Marseille proceedings described these issues very, very clearly. Um, Yves Fameau, who 
also described these issues very clearly. And then in Landau and Lichitz, and I meant to look up the page number, I'm sorry, I forgot to do that. I had the second edition. And if you open it up to the, to the theory on, to the section on pipe flow transition, you'll find exactly this kind of description. And in fact, what is described in Landau and Lipschitz in just a couple paragraphs is a very clear explanation of what transition looks like where you have a patch of turbulence surrounded by laminar flow and that you have fronts between turbulent and laminar flow and then they're either expanding or contracting depending on the Reynolds number. So these ideas are, are not new. Um, however, what's missing from this theory and what I showed you about intermittency, and this is the thing we're concerned now with intermittency, intermittency is missing from, from all this work and it's missing because of what I told you that the shear profile, I mean, excuse me, the mean profile is so important to this problem. Um, it's that interplay, the fact that the puff modifies the shear profile and once that shear profile is modified, you can no longer sustain turbulence and you get that, those localized states. That is missing from this work and we have to add it. Right? And as you can see from here, what I need to somehow is incorporate the, 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 the mean profile and I'm going to do it a very nice proxy for the state of the shear profile is the centerline velocity. You can see it's large for laminar flow and it's shorter for a blunted uh, turbulent profile. And so that provides me with a nice scalar quantity in which I can use to distinguish these two states. Okay, so I've written this up together with collaborators in a number of papers, some of which are, um, and particularly this JFM perspective, which is available to you and I'll just jump ahead. Now, the thing is, I, I don't know if you can hear this or not. So the reason I knew how to do this is because I also study these kinds of problems. And this is, oh, that's going to go around again. Um, this is an electrocardiogram uh, for a beating heart. And um, what it's an electrical measurement. The electrical activity in the heart is what uh, controls the heart activity and leads to pumping of blood, organization, organized pumping of blood. And what these, these pulses are, are effectively puffs. The mathematical description of these is nearly identical to what happens in puff in pipe flow. There's an excitation with a nearly a constant um, amplitude and width, followed by a refractory period before the next one can occur. Okay? And this exists throughout biology. It's how your brain works. It's how your, uh, your, uh, accident, your, your nerves fire. It's an extremely robust mechanism. It has to be, I mean, biology wouldn't pick something that was not robust for these crit mission critical tasks. It's a highly nonlinear state. There is no small puff. There's big puffs or no puffs, okay? And it's spatial, temporal in nature. There is no, there's no action potential that sits there. It fires, okay? And, and these things is what's known in the mathematical biology literature is that these are um, generic features and they're well captured and well understood using simple polynomial nonlinearity. And for those of you who know, this is in fact dates back to Vanderpol. Vanderpol, if you think about Vanderpol oscillators, it's a large amplitude oscillator with simple polynomial equations, and it's really kind of part of what's going on here. Okay, so here's the simplest PDE that I could write down that describes what it is I want to describe. And I'm not so, I don't want to be so concerned with the equations, but the pictures, and hopefully you can get this. So there are two variables, I already told you. One is the turbulence intensity, and the other is the centerline velocity, but I want you to think of it as a, as a proxy for the state of the mean shear profile, right? So I'm plotting these two in a phase plane, and just to orient you, this is laminar, fully developed laminar flow. The turbulence is zero, and the laminar and the centerline velocity is at its maximum value. So I now want to describe the dynamics of the two variables in the absence of any spatial effects. So the, the U dynamics, the, 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 the centerline velocity or the mean profile, is described this way. This is the curve on which u dot is equal to zero and it divides u dot negative from u dot positive. And the way you think about it, the only important thing you need to know is that when you have turbulence, this, the shear profile blunts, okay? The center line velocity decreases. When you don't have turbulence, the center line velocity increases back towards laminar flow. I believe that's the only important thing you need to know there. As far as the turbulence goes, I have turbulence. So this is my bi-stability that I've been talking about since slide two. I have a laminar state, I have a turbulent state, and a threshold dividing the two. However, here I'm showing as a function of the, it now depends on the state of the shear profile. If I blunt the shear profile, I can lose that equilibrium. All right, so it, now it also depends on the shear profile. That's the only thing I've added co compared to what you'd find in Landau and Lipschitz and, and, and other people. 
So now the other thing is that we need Reynolds number, and Reynolds number will, uh, if I vary Reynolds number, the 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 the, uh, the null clines, the, the the zeros will will do this, and you'll understand as I put it all together. So now I plot the blue and the red together. Wherever the blue curve intersects the red curve, I have a fixed point of the full system. Okay, and this fixed point here is my fully developed laminar flow. It exists and is linearly stable for all values of the Reynolds number. As I vary the Reynolds number, what happens is the system changes. I get another intersection, and that is my stable, fully developed uh, turbulent flow. That's my second equilibrium that, that has now appeared. Okay, it's what I've been discussing since the beginning. Okay. The difference between this and the tape measure and what you read in Landau and Lipschitz now, oh, oh, sorry, let me just say, you have to add uh, downstream advection and uh, some spatial coupling to get the full model. So now I want to discuss, so, Let's discuss then what is different between this and what is in these uh, classical works. Is that I now have a puff, uh, now I have a slug and a puff. And you can understand that's as follows. Let me do the slug first. I always do the slug first. As I look in space, I have laminar flow upstream. I then generate turbulence. The shear profile blunts, and then I reach an equilibrium. That is what you see here. I'm in the laminar state. The turbulence increases. As a result, the shear profile blunts, and I reach an equilibrium. The puff, on the other hand, Starts the same, laminar flow, turbulence increases, blunting of the shear profile, but now there's no equilibrium and uh, the turbulence decays and then I recover laminar flow, which again, you can see here, there's no equilibrium and I return. Okay, so this, so that's the picture. And in the, again, the mathematical biology literature and my, many other literatures, you refer to this case as bistable. Again, the word I've been saying since the beginning, you have two stable fixed points. And this is the case that you refer to as excitable. So you can excite the system, but there is no other uh, fixed point available. Right, so these are our two systems. To have a, a complete theory, you're going to have to introduce fluctuations. There are two ways to do that. Either you can do it with deterministic chaos or you can do it with multiplicative noise, or you could perhaps do it with something else. We know that the, the, the Navier-Stokes equations are deterministic, so there's, that in some ways is an ideal thing to do, but there are pluses and minuses in another case, and I'm not going to, 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 to say how I've done this. You can read the papers. So let me just make sure I'm on time here. So I'm now going to go fairly quickly through um, just some examples of things. Again, I've already mentioned this, this work by Baofeng Song, in which he did direct numerical simulations of puffs and slugs, actually measuring real quantities of the turbulence intensity and the center line velocity, and shows that you get the transition as expected between the excitable case of a puff and then the, the slugs. There's in fact different kinds of slugs as I've already highlighted, and this was all studied in this paper. Uh, I wanna uh, acknowledge, uh, mention that Rinaldi et al, who uh, recently, um, uh, extended this work and considered what happens when you bend a pipe uh, and what the effect is on the fronts and, and so forth in those cases. And I'll just, again, I'll let you read that. There's also a, uh, I wrote a uh, focus on fluids about this work and you can read that as well. Um, I don't really want to go through into a long explanation of this. Again, I've, there, there are these different kinds of slugs which I've alluded to. I don't want to explain. We've analyzed this. You're able to understand certain things about the speed and the onset of that. The only thing I really want to focus to, to mention about this is that, again, these ideas, while I'm specifically interested in the intermittent flows, they really apply to much higher Reynolds numbers than just the intermittent regime. So I believe it's, it's much broader than that. And then the final thing I'll say about part one is this. And that's a bit much to take in. What you're seeing is three panels, and in each panel, it's divided into two. On the left is reality, and by reality, I mean something that comes from a direct numerical simulation of the Navier-Stokes equations or experiments on, on experiments or both. Uh, and then in the right column is what comes out of the model, one of the various models that, um, that have been proposed to, to understand these things. And I am not going to go through all these, and I hope you don't find this too weird, but the reason for presenting this is, is twofold. One is to just say that there are a lot of, there's a rich variety of phenomena that people in the field are interested in, have studied, continue to study associated with this, that again, I'm not going to talk about. Each one of these things would take five minutes to discuss. Um, but also to, to, to say that these, that this idea of excitability, device stability with, with, with fluctuations captures pretty well the majority, if not all, of the phenomena. I don't want to oversell it. I mean, it's, it's qualitative. 
at best semi-quantitative. Uh, there's a lot of work that could be done to improve it, but the essential mechanism, I'm convinced, is correct. This essential mechanism of bi-stability to excitability um, is, is what's driving the phenomenon. Okay, so I seem to be good on times. So let me go on now to the, to the second part. So I've discussed now this, what I, in, in simple terms, what I believe is the, the origin of intermittency in these flows. What is the basic cause, why it exists. Um, and now I wanted to turn to this, uh, this critical point and the onset of, uh, of turbulence. And this brings me to uh, the issue of statistical phase transition. So this was uh, uh, originated in the early 1980s with papers by Janssen and Grasberger. And they described um, uh, statistical phase transition or theory of statistical phase transitions to apply to a lot of systems such as heterogeneous chem chemical reactions or forest fires or some idealized forest fire perhaps or flow through porous media or flu epidemics. And, um, um, and let me just give you a quote from Grasberger's paper. It says, it suggests another type of universality comprising all critical points with an absorbing state and a single order parameter. Okay. So there's a lot to take in there, some of which I'll explain, some of which I won't, but you'll notice that there's universality in here that should apply to all of these systems, that there are critical points, well-defined critical points for these systems. Right? And, let me just, and let me say this, because I'm surely going to make this mistake. In the statistical physics literature, the class of problems, the, the set of exponents and, and, the, and, the, and the universality class of this set of problems is referred to as directed percolation. So you think of percolation through a porous media. Um, I am not going to use that as the uh, example, but I probably can't help but say directed percolation, directed percolation. If I do that, I just want you to, to know why. I think a much better example in terms of what we're going to see is flu epidemics. And of course, the, the current uh, uh, situation lends itself to that naturally anyway, because it involves both space and time in a natural way. So it was Yves Pomeau who actually, also in the 1980s, not very long after Grasberger and Prakash, uh, I mean, um, Janssen and Grasberger, um, realized that the subcritical shear flows had the characteristics of what uh, Janssen and Grasberger described, and therefore you might be able to observe that kind of universality, those critical points in these systems. And that was taken up uh, uh, early on by the group in Saclay, and they did a lot, I mean, they clearly had exactly the right ideas. They were, they were following along the, along the, the correct path. The, their system sizes turned out to be uh, what we now understand to be too small. I may come back to say that, but I, I really want to highlight this work because because the, the ideas were, were, were spot on as to what, what was going on. Okay, so I need to describe now a little bit more about the phenomenology in the transitional regime. I'm not going to describe everything, but I'm going to describe a couple of key ingredients. And what I want to do is I want to use the model to do this. Um, so I've described to you, um, so I'm showing here again, the comparison of DNS and model. Sorry, I'm not saying this, but that's the best way. And I've described to you that there are puffs, and I've described to you that there are slugs, but I haven't really described to you what goes on uh, in detail. And rather than showing you um, images from DNS and experiments and so forth, I want to use the model which captures these features uh, from the purposes of this talk perfectly well, and it just allows me a lot of freedom in discussion. So that's what I'm going to do. So let me turn over here to this, and hopefully this is going to, if it does not work, I'm going to jump to a movie, but hopefully this will work. Clear, pipe, top, pipe. Okay, here we go. So what I'm showing you is, uh, oh, no, let me not touch anything. What I'm showing you is a simulation of, of the model equations. And what's shown here in red is the turbulent intensity Q. There are two variables, turbulent intensity Q. And what's shown here in blue is the centerline velocity U. And this is the, the, their state for laminar flow. And I'm running the model, it's, it's simulating, but as we know, laminar flow is linearly stable. It's gonna do this all day long as long as I sit, in it, sit there. But if I give it a kick, as I, as I described, you, you kick the flow someplace upstream and you'll generate one of these puffs. And the people in this field will know this really looks a whole lot like a puff in pipe flow. You see this, uh, this decrease in centerline velocity with the recovery, this refractory region. And so this will go, ah, it decayed. Oh, well, that's too bad. Here, let's start it again. So it's going to go down and it goes out the, the downstream end of the pipe and it comes back in the upstream. I just have periodic boundary conditions. 
So it, it, it moves as more or less a solitary structure. There's a little bit of uh, weightlessness here. A whole lot of CPU time is being spent here on Zoom in my talk. But it's going to go around. And eventually, what's going to happen is this one's going to decay too. In fact, you can keep doing this all day long. And if you got out a stopwatch and recorded the time and wrote it down every time you did this, and you did this a few thousand times, and plot those, you would realize that the, the statistics of this are Poissonian. This acts like a memoryless process. It's a completely deterministic system, by the way. Um, it's completely reproducible. The only thing I'm changing with each realization is I'm adding a very, very small random number to each initial condition. Right? So what we see is that th these turbulent pops, and this is well documented in lots and lots of flows and lots and lots of cases, um, these states are in fact metastable. They look as though they're stable, but if you look at them and analyze them carefully and analyze them statistically, you find out in fact that they're not. And this is why, you know, again, statistical phase transitions. So now let me increase the Reynolds number in the model and, uh, and start an, a puff again. So I'm now going to a higher Reynolds number. And again, I have a puff and it's going to go along as a, again, more or less, you can see it's wiggling around a bit more, but it's going to go along in more or less the solid state structure. And again, I have no control over how long this is going to last. I'll just keep talking until something happens. There, okay. Um, it's going to come around again. So now I have two puffs, right? This is a process known as puff splitting, right? Let me do another one and hopefully. And here too, you can, um, you can measure statistics. You can, you can start the simulation, you can run, and you can wait until, oh, now I got three. And I got more, okay? Let me go and launch another one. And you can wait and you can measure the time until the very first time it splits. And if you do that, you'll find that that's also a Bayes Poisson statistics. It's a memoryless process, and the, 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 relevant, the relevant quantity that you can draw from that is the mean lifetime, right? And so just one more thing, I'm gonna just, this is not part of what I need to discuss now, but just to show you the model, this is what a slug looks like, by the way. If you run the model, it, it spreads out. And if I now just decrease the Reynolds number, I can recover one of these intermittent states. Okay, so this is what intermittency looks like in a pipe. And I will just show you one more thing, if I can do it. And if I can't, I'll give up. If you look, this is extremely long, uh, long uh, spatial scales, and I'm not going to run the simulation that would take up all my CPU power. But if you look at this, um, they're not equally spaced. They, 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 um, they come in clumps like this. And I'm going to discuss those statistics in just a moment. All right, let me come back to my talk. OK. So hopefully we're clear on that. So that's the movie I would have showed you if the, if the simulations didn't work, but the simulations did. So again, back to that we have uh, two states. We have turbulent and laminar flow. So in the statistical physics uh, um, terminology, one would refer to the turbulent state as the excited state, which aligns nicely with the idea of excitable media, et cetera, and the laminar flow as the absorbing state. And what I just showed you is that in the intermittent uh, regime, there was some degree of randomness um, turbulence will either revert to laminar flow or it will excite neighboring uh, laminar flow and basically proliferate through one of these puff splitting processes. Laminar flow, on the other hand, is pretty boring. It will not spontaneously become turbulent. It's a linearly stable state. And it, if you start with the system in, a linear, in, in laminar flow, it will never, ever, ever leave it. You have to kick it somehow to get it out of that state. So these um, features are precisely those that Janssen and Grasberger described. They're precisely the features that they were interested in. So turbulent intermittent, or I should say, transitional turbulence has these, um, has these features. And this was the observation of E. Pomo in the 1980s. So let me show you in a little bit more detail. So I'm going to show you now plots. I'm going to, we're going to have an active state and an absorbing state. The active state, you should think of a turbulence and black. And the absorbing state, will you should think of a laminar flow or white. And the controlling parameter is the rate of spreading over the rate of decay. And let me just take the opportunity to say, you could also think of, as I said, flu epidemics, you could also think of the turbulent state as infected individuals. And you can think of the laminar state as uninfected but susceptible individuals. So I'm going to run a generic model. It's a coupled map lattice whose on-site dynamics is this. I don't want to say anything more about it. It's just a typical model. I just want to illustrate, illustrate the generic behavior, which you will all recognize immediately. So I'm going to start both of these with an initial C. So I have an initially uh, susceptible population. I have an initial laminar state. 
are all white. I introduce the seed of turbulence or seed of infection. If the value of R is small, as we know for uh, epidemics, then, that, then the infection will die out. It will not persist to infinite time. And once you're clear of the infection, once you're all white, it will never ever come back. If the value of R is sufficiently large, then the infection will spread, become endemic to the population. Um, okay, I think that's uh, clear enough. Um, so if you look on, um, uh, now in, in finer steps in the control parameter R, and this time I just for variety, I started from a kind of uniformly turbulent or infected state. It doesn't really matter how you start. Um, you, 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 this is what you see. So what you see is that at low values, again, you, asymptotically, you, you're in this laminar state, this um, absorbing state, and you'll never come out. However, um, beyond some value, you do asymptotically for a long time, you always remain, there's always some amount of the turbulent state. There's always some amount of the infection. Now, as you kind of go to a thermodynamic limit where you have to keep making the system sizes larger and larger and wait longer and longer in time, you find that there's actually a precise, sharp, critical point which distinguishes these cases. Below that point, asymptotically, you will be laminar with probability one. Above that critical point with probability one, you will, you will have some turbulence, some infection remaining for all time. Again, you have to take a thermodynamic limit for this to be precise. Sorry, my, my computer is going, I, I think I'll just keep going, but I may have to switch. Um, no, it's not. Okay, sorry. I thought I was still running my model, so I thought I would stop it. All right, so we're now going to get to critical exponents and what you would measure and how you would precisely characterize this. And the first thing is turbulent fraction. You can see here, if you just look at asymptotically the turbulent fraction, the percentage of black in these diagrams, you can see that it increases as you increase the distance from the critical value. So that's our order parameter. If you think back to the Janssen Grasberger um, statement of, of, of what's going on, there was a critical and there was, there was an, a scalar order parameter. That scalar order parameter for us is the turbulent fraction. Below the critical value, it's, it's zero, and above it, it grows continuously. It grows continuously with a universal exponent beta, which is independent of the system being investigated. Okay, so if you wait long enough, um, your, your system size is big enough, and you collect the, 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 the statistics of the turbulent fraction, you will get a curve that goes like this universally. Okay? And you can also see, if you look at these diagrams, you can see an increased sparseness of the pattern as you decrease, okay? So the, the scales are diverging and there's both a length scale and a time scale. Those are not equivalent. Time is this way, space is this way. Those scales are not equivalent, but both scales um, uh, diverge. And I'm not gonna define them precisely for you, but you can easily see that with your eyes. And so we have negative exponents indicating the divergence of both length and, and, and time scales. So we have then, um, the, the, this, this critical point is then characterized by three, um, uh, the diverge or the, uh, by three critical scalings, one for the order parameter and two for the uh, characteristic scales. Any other scalings uh, uh, associated with this transition can be determined from these three. These are, as I said, universal. They only depend on the physical dimensions of the system and are otherwise independent of details. Again, let me just take the moment to emphasize something so that I don't make sure it's really clear. This, this kind of case here, this is a three-dimensional flow, okay? There's turbulence here, real, there's a three-dimensional flow. I'm gonna call this two-dimensional, okay? Just to be clear, we call this two-dimensional in this uh, directed percolation uh, uh, world. So there have been um, some, a number of papers uh, on this. I want to just mostly discuss in detail two. Uh, the first is experimental. It's the work of Lumut et al. Um, out of Bjorn Hoff's lab. Um, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful experiment. They built a, a, a very large aspect ratio taylor Cuet system in which the circumference of the flow is about 3,000 times the fluid gap. So again, in this kind of um, percolation transi statistical transition world, we're calling this a one-dimensional system, even though it's a full three-dimensional flow. And what you're seeing here are then experimental measurements of um, space circumference of the uh, apparatus Time now going downwards, sometimes down, sometimes up. Here it goes down um, for three different values of the Reynolds number. And we see just what I showed you in those uh, previous images. If you're below critical, the, the, the blue is turbulence and the yellow is laminar flow. 
you, you have turbulence, it persists for a while, but eventually dies out. And once you're in laminar flow, you'll never recover. Above, you remain intermittent for forever. If you're right near critical, you're kind of marginally going to sustain or not. Again, as you make the system size increasingly large, that will become really a sharp point. Then comes the hard part, uh, which is also kind of uninteresting to present in these talks, so I'll really go over that quickly, is that you need to then measure things very, very carefully. Um, what they were able to show is that there really is a continuous transition of the turbulence fraction from zero. It has the correct scaling. You need to get two orders of magnitude. That's the gold standard, two, order, uh, two, two decades of scaling. And they did this for, for the different critical exponents, and they found that they agree with those uh, predicted by, uh, by directed percolation, by this universality class um, described by Janssen and Grassberger. So this is the first direct confirmation that a subcritical route to turbulence really is a continuous transition when viewed in this way. It occurs, um, it gives you precisely defined critical points with universal scaling exponents. We know exactly then how to do this, exactly how to put this in a class of problems that, that people study in other fields. Okay. Now, as I told you, so that's effectively a one-dimensional system. I told you that, that um, the exponents depend on dimensionality. So we, and we means uh, Matt Chantry, um, decided to, wanted to do this in a two-dimensional system. And so what Matt considered was a stress-free a stress flow driven by a body force, what we refer to as wallet flow. Um, and it mimics plain couette flow, but um, uh, avoids the boundary layers, which, um, which cause you a lot of computational costs. So it's an idealized planar shear flow. But by going to this, Matt was able to simulate uh, domains that look like this. Now you, and I, again, I can't see what you see. So this was the, what was considered, this is a very large uh, aspect ratio domain. And let me just say, this unfortunately is not nearly large enough. It, it turns out you get bad answers if you, well. So this is Matt's domain. I just, I don't know if you can see it. So this is, this is Matt's on the same, you know, the same scale this way. So this is what you have to go to. And this is what Matt was able to achieve. And um, I have to say it's marginal. It's good enough, but you would have liked to have gone to um, four times that size. Anyway, so what Matt did, oh, so let me just show you, uh, this is probably more interesting than the exponents. So I'm going to plot here now, turbulence fraction is a function of time on a log-log scale, and I'm going to show you again the typical thing of three cases. One is below critical, one is above critical, and one is pretty near critical. Um, again, you see these, these banded patterns, this banded turbulence that's typical of these uh, uh, planar shear flows. So just in case you're worried here, this, the, for, the, for the one that's going to decay, Matt only simulated in a smaller domain and then just tiled it. It wasn't worth the expense to simulate uh, decaying turbulence in such a large domain. So that one's going to decay. This one above, the Reynolds number is above, it's going to saturate and reach a statistical equilibrium. The, the movie is frozen, but that would continue to evolve and you would reach a, an equilibrium turbulent fraction. This one is this one very near critical is going to continue to decay. What I didn't tell you is that dashed line there is the exponent associated with directed percolation. Okay, and so Matt was able to to verify all the scalings, and um, so this is the first um, convincing evidence. Let me say it this way, uh, um, of, of 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 this process in a planar shear flow. We have a, a, this continuous transition with these precise, we can precisely define a critical point with the universal scales. So that's only the one I show you in detail. Uh, let me just say there's ongoing work. I just want to flash it and give a um, shout out to these various people who are working on this. Plain channel flow has a lot of interesting uh, tricks about it and it's very quite an interesting thing. It's a hot topic currently. Pipe flow also has a certain uh, interesting things having to do with the universality there. I'll, I'll, I'll highlight my, uh, my colleagues who are working on this. It's unpublished work, so I'm obviously not prepared to talk about it, but I just want to give a shout out to those things. Okay, so it's an exciting field. So let me, let me turn to concluding remarks. Um, so I've discussed these two things. I've discussed the organizing center, which gives rise to this intermittency in the first place, why we have it, why it exists. And then the other thing I focused on are this critical phenomena associated with statistical phase transitions. So I wanted to discuss this a little bit. For the first thing, I, I'm just going to um, just review what I've already told you, not so much discuss. But what I've told you is that we have two equilibria available to the system, laminar flow and turbulent flow, but 
what you should really see in terms of the intermittency is that when you lose this equilibrium, this second equilibrium, that doesn't mean the loss of turbulence. It means it goes into this excitable regime. And the excitable regime is the exciting regime where all this fun stuff happens. You have to add fluctuations to it. But once you do add fluctuations to it, you really do have, I won't say everything, you have a lot of phenomena. So it really provides, my view is that this transition between biasability and excitability provides the, um, the organizing center for these wall-bounded shear flows. And I really want to emphasize that this is a strongly nonlinear, highly robust mechanism, and it dictates the spatial te temporal dynamics in the region turbulence. So that's, that's my view on that. So, oh, in particular, it gives us the thing that we're going to care about then is the, the spatially temporal uh, um, complex uh, phenomenon. Then I want to discuss this a little bit in more depth. So, um, and coming back to this, uh, this um, quote of uh, uh, Grassberger and the, the fact that we have this universality uh, in these systems, uh, and I want to discuss that. So, and its connection to the route to turbulence. I originally wrote this, that classical route to turbulence, but I could get into a lot of trouble for that. Um, certainly, I mean, the idea of route to turbulence is perhaps itself a very rich area, but Certainly one idea of the route to turbulence uh, it dates back to uh, uh, Landau and Hoff, the idea that you have a sequence, a cascade of instabilities, each in increasing the temporal complexity of the flow. That was then later modified by ideas of Ruel and Tawkins, and universality was brought in by Feigenbaum. Uh, here I show experiments by Gallup and Swinney um, illustrating this, this idea of this classical route to turbulence where here again, this is taylor Wet flow where only the inner cylinder is rotating and I increase the Reynolds number high. They increase the Reynolds number by increasing the rotation rate of the inner cylinder. And one uh, sees an uh, uh, a sequence of instabilities eventually gives, giving rise to turbulence. So we see a, an increase in temporal, temporal complexity giving rise to turbulent flow. And so there's a lot of uh, stability analysis, bifurcation, dynamical systems goes into this view and kind of through uh, Feigenbaum, and I'll give a shout out to my colleague, uh, Predrag Sotanovich, we get a lot of understanding of the universality in how this happens. This is very, very distinct from what I've described here. Um, this, these take place where spatial, the spatial temporal character of it is fundamental. It doesn't exist without the spatial temporal character. And it'll come back to laminar flow. You have laminar flow and we know it's a linearly stable state. And if you want to understand the transition to turbulence in pipe flow, we know you don't do it by studying the linear stability of, pipe, uh, of, of the laminar flow, that's for sure. But you don't even do it by the weekly nonlinear theory. That will get you nowhere. It's, that's not the way the flow becomes turbulent. And I like to think you don't, look here you can look at trees. You go look at trees and you can look at trees and you can look at trees and you will never understand anything about a forest fire. If you want to understand a forest fire, you have to light the trees on fire. That's what you have to do. And you have to, and it's a statistical thing, even light one tree on fire might not tell you because you light one tree on fire and it might not persist. What you have to do is you have to be able to, to you have to initiate the things and then look over long space time scales and then ask the statistical question as to what persists. And that's the way we now understand the way to look at and to organize these the systems and to understand the route to turbulence. So we inject, we wait, and then we collect statistics. The hard part is the size of the systems. I'll refer you back to Matt's uh, numerical computations. That's what's the hard part, and that's why this is challenging. However, let me just say it has brought tremendous, this view has brought tremendous clarity to, the, to this field. But when people study these systems, which seem big, and again, I'm not criticizing them, but you had to, you, you couldn't have known how big you had to make your system. When people study systems of this size or, or other sizes, this was the original Sac Clay experiments. And again, I'm not criticizing, you didn't know where to start. But the thing is you get different answers depending on, on what the system was and you didn't know whether it was continuous or discontinuous, you didn't know whether there's any universality, right? And we now, this is now we've gotten over this by at least looking at some systems in which we've been fully able to characterize them and fully been able to understand them. And the final thing is that, that this has also provided a beautiful confirmation of these universal scalings predicted by Janssen and Grassberger many years ago. And so for, with that, I'll end and uh, thank you and take your questions. Right, that's, that's a good clarifying question. Uh, I, I'm, I'm using um, 
there is certainly intermittency within turbulence. Even what I'm calling the fully turbulent state, I'm viewing that as an equilibrium, as a simple, I'm basically collapsing it to a fixed point. But of course, that's not true. There's intermittency with a slightly different meaning of the word within that turbulence itself. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly, but it's, it's certainly good for me to clarify to the audience that when I say intermittency, I mean a very large scale intermittency between turbulent laminar flow and not the kind of intermittency that I think you're referring to. And then to maybe perhaps try to answer your question is to say, I don't know. I mean, as I say, I don't know whether the kind of intermittency that I think you're referring to plays any role. I've kind of washed it out, let me say that. Oh, well, most definitely. I mean, the, the Reynolds number, I mean, the viscosity appears in the, visc in the dissipation term, of course, not in the production, but it appears in the, in the, in the yeah. dissipation. That's, ex that's, precisely, that's precisely how it appears, in fact. I, I didn't get into that detail, but yeah, it appears. What is changing as you change the Reynolds number is the, 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 that, dis that dissipation, well, a lot of things change, but the, the thing in terms of the equations that you see is the viscosity in the dissipation. Well, it's going to be around two, uh, 2040, 2400, I mean, 2040. We know that because we can measure the individual decay and spreading processes. It's going to be slightly different from that because of correlation. And I'll defer that, uh, that issue to Bjorn Hoff and, and his collaborators who will be telling you in publication, hopefully very soon. But it'll be, I think, below 2060 between 2060 and 2000, between 2040 and 2060, surely. No, I don't think I need that. I mean, I don't, I, what I need, what I need are two equilibria. I need a spatial temporal system with the two equilibria. And just to say, I mean, I, I, I'm going to get asked, ask, I can see how the, the, where the questions are going. So everything I know that came from this book, and I don't know anything that isn't in this book, you can buy it from Cambridge University Press. Um, and and, and, and in, in this book, and this, you see, I, I have it all marked up here, is th this discussion of basically what people just refer to as turbulent pipe flow and the balance between the mean shear profile and, the, and, and I'm kind of ignoring everything else about that state. So there's lots of interesting questions about how you would do, say, do geophysical phenomena. And, and in fact, it's one of the things we're kind of discussing. But I, um, currently, I don't know. But I don't think I need any of that phenomena for these kind of, these, again, one of the things I tried to emphasize, let me take the opportunity to say, both when I was discussing why there's intermittency, but then in terms of the, the statistical phase transitions, everything I discuss is extremely robust. I don't, you have to have certain ingredients have to be present, but the details of those ingredients, I don't think matters very much. That's why we see them and see them in lots of cases. So, so when you, you contrasted your view with the, the um, more traditional route of turbulence through a sequence of bifurcations. Are you suggesting that, that different systems display one route over the other or that they're two different right. ways of seeing the same thing? Oh, oh no, no, uh, sorry, that, that's good to clarify the question. No, I'm saying that there are, different, there are different circumstances in these highly subcritical where the only state, you, 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 there is no weak, I mean, some people would call it weak turbulence, but there is no, you either have a puff or you don't have a puff. There is no kind of half puff. There's no weak puff. So it's, it's a strongly, highly nonlinear mechanism from the beginning. There is nothing else. And in those systems, and I'm not saying necessarily you have this, but those are the classes that you apply as opposed to the classic Taylor Couette where you increase the, the temporal component. So I'm saying there's, a, and I'm not saying that these are the only two, by the way, either. I'm saying, I'm just distinguishing those two and there can be potentially other quite different ones. I'm not, don't have an opinion about that or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do you have any, any insight into, uh where the boundaries between those kinds of systems lie? And if I hand ah, you a well, system. Yeah, okay, so well, fortunately, Taylor Quet provides us a nice knob because we know in the strongly counter-rotating case, it's the subcritical scenario I just described. In the co-rotating, it's the other scenario. So there's a nice knob there you can play with. I'll let you do that. It's, I, no, I, I would say it's not, it's not a question of amplitude. It's only a question of Reynolds, it's only a question of Reynolds number. It's, it's, no, I would say it's not a question of amplitude. I mean, you might be able to get a puff split by you know, playing with the amplitude, but you will not get, again, the only, if you're in the puff regime, the only way you can sustain turbulence, the only way it can exist is if there are laminar gaps in between. If there are no laminar gaps in between, either it will just fall down. You cannot sustain. So 
No, it's either pop or not. I mean, there's, there's this, I didn't show you. I mean, there, there's, there's more details than I'm telling you, but that if you get right to the, the, the transition between puffs and slugs and you do get these kind of really kind of puff like slug like things, I'm not saying that they're, but, but if you have, if you're clearly in the puff regime, then you're in the puff regime and you don't have slugs, no matter what amplitude you get. Okay, and also the, the the structure of the puff doesn't play any role either. Oh, I say the structure of the, uh, yeah, no, it, it well, uh, you know, I'm I'm skipping over a whole lot of things and just providing you know the kind of the skeleton. Mm -hmm. The structure of a puff is really very important. Now, a whole lot is known about that, both in terms of periodic orbit theory, the structure of the the fundamental uh, roll streak wave structure which maintains wall bounded turbulence there's a whole lot of important phenomena there that i'm not describing which is important no i'm, I'm not saying that the structure of the puff isn't important to a puff but i'm saying that the structure of a puff is i can reduce it to its essence which is that it's being energized on one side and and um leaving behind a wake on the other side that's a good question i think I'll say that those are potentially, uh, those are different. I mean, there's no reason they would be the same. Um, I would say that, no, in fact, I will go, I will say that, that the lowest Reynolds number for which you can have an edge state will be below the critical Reynolds number as I've defined, because you can have puffs, long lived transients below the critical Reynolds number. They have edge states. The point is they're not stable, they're metastable. I mean, in fact, that gets all back to the edge. In fact, the puff, I mean, there is no edge in the sense that that puff eventually will cross that edge and go back to laminar flow. Well, yeah, that's actually a very good question. I mean, the, the, um, I think I can't, I, I, I prefer not to answer that. I mean, I don't, I, I, I think I'm gonna have to think about that. Um, because in some sense I say that it, it has to in the sense that, that I'm putting that in. And so, but on the other hand, it doesn't really matter too much what statistics I put into that deterministic. Yeah, let me just say, I, that's a good question. I'll think about it. A number of people tried that. I will just say, and I, I was gonna put it aside because I thought I would get that question at the end of this. I did write down a model in 2011, and I, to this day, believe that model is essentially correct in, in producing the periodic structure that you see in, I'm uh, speaking to young ones, so we don't know these details, that you see in uh, Goet flow if you work in a tilted domain. And in fact, there's a lot of things that you could, uh, um, there's some, a paper by Shi et al from 2013 or 14, Bjorn Hauf's, uh, Shi Avila Hoff, and with that model, you can reproduce that phenomenology almost exactly. However, what you don't get is the tilted structure, and that's still an ongoing um, kind of um, open question. You can see that, that, that percolation has become, uh, you know, all of a sudden, uh, you know, more common knowledge than it used to be because people can understand how things percolate or don't percolate through a society. Um, you know, I, you know, it'd be great if I actually had a real application. I don't, um, so. Well, presumably transition and control. Oh, okay, yeah, important. actually I do have an application that's not my own, but it, it comes again from Bjorn Hoff's lab, but it is captured again. It's one of the things not on my, you know, comparison chart, but it could be on the comparison chart, which is it contains in there because you have the mean shear profile in there. You can, uh, one of the ideas of control is if you can somehow blunt the mean shear profile, the shear profile such that turbulence can't sustain, then you can kill turbulence while maintaining laminar flow. So that's an idea. And that is captured in the model. Belfang, in fact, put it in his thesis where you can, the model, is, this is one of the ways in which the model is least faithful. It has a phenomenon, it has the effect, but it's not perhaps as uh, quite sufficiently quantitatively correct. But the idea that, and, and there's, a, there's a number of people, uh, let me just say, uh, Ashley Willis, um, sorry, I'm going to draw a blank here, but, but and maybe even Rich have been looking at these ideas. So there is, and I'm sorry if I'm not seeing everybody's name, but there is this idea of control methods. Some of that is picked up by the model. You don't necessarily need the model. You can just do DNS, et cetera. But there are 
our ideas of control that closely tie with what I told you because what I told you about the importance of the shear profile and the idea of modifying the shear profile so as to kill turbulence is certainly something that's a very active area of research. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you have channels and you have pipes and then you have various kind of rotations and things, uh, coet and so forth. And you can drive them with walls or you can drive them with pressure gradients and you can put those together. And then if you're, you know, ambitious, you can start adding other effects. This is also seen in um, uh, MHD, by the way, the, the idea of, of puffs. Um, Thomas Bach has, uh, has uh, seen these things. I, I, I don't know how to answer the question. So, I mean, frequency will have to, I mean, so I assume that's kind of like uh, an issue of turbulent fraction because the, you know, statistical, I mean, there's no, there's no periodicity here. Um, it, well, it decreases, I mean, it, 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 the frequency increases with Reynolds number, it decreases with decreasing Reynolds number. I mean, it's, it's, it scales with Reynolds number. 